true words, but you can change the tide of the times by banding together, volunteering in your communities and working on your personal development. Hello and welcome to another edition of Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. We have a lot of interesting and informative features lined up for you today, so please stay with us. What are you doing to help the fight against crime? Sitting on the corner, minding your own business, definitely not going to work. It is time for us to unite. Unite. Unite for change. Citizens coming together to make their respective communities safer. The police, schools, public health, business, churches, NGOs, parents and neighborhood watch volunteers. As we, the police, do our job. We, as citizens, need to do our part as well. Report crimes or even suspicious activities. Let's all work together. As one united front against crime. And make Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Unite for Change, an initiative of the Ministry of National Security. Good day, I'm Andrea Chisholm and this is your GIS News for Monday, March 24. The Health Ministry is heightening its tuberculosis surveillance and public education activities this week as it joins the international observance of March 24 as World Tuberculosis Day. This year's World Health Organization WHO theme reflects estimates that while roughly 9 million people become ill with TB each year, another 3 million are missed by public health systems. According to internist consultant physician at the National Chest Hospital, Dr. Tanya Foster, Jamaica's case level for the past 10 years has remained relatively steady at about 6 per 100,000. On average for the past 20 years, the number is about 114 cases. For the last two years though, we've had a relative decline in the numbers to about um, 95, 96. The Health Ministry is collaborating with the National Chest Hospital and the Pan American Health Organization in implementing the week of activities marking World TB Day 2014. The observance began with a national church service on Sunday. And then we'll roll into our symposium geared at um, sensitizing healthcare workers here at the National Chest Hospital um, on Tuesday and on Wednesday will be out in the community um, in terms of public displays and um, education. Within the last year, Jamaica's National TB program successfully distributed the National Strategic Plan for Tuberculosis and started construction of Jamaica's first isolation facility for multidrug resistant tuberculosis and other serious respiratory illnesses. The Anti-Dumping and Subsidies Commission is examining allegations of dual energy pricing costs reportedly being practiced by CARICOM partner Trinidad and Tobago. While speaking in Parliament last Tuesday, Commerce Minister Anton Hilton said the Commission had been meeting with the local private sector to discuss their concerns. The Commission is conducting research on potential subsidy programs being provided to Trinidad and Tobago producers by the Government of Trinidad and Tobago. The Commission's actions follows a series of interventions by the Jamaican government to get a fulsome understanding about Trinidad's energy pricing method. The matter was also addressed at the recent Special Council for Trade and Economic Development quoted on energy meeting. In the meantime, Minister Hilton is reminding the private sector that they can take the matter to the Caribbean Court of Justice. Government's Agritourism Farmers Market Initiative is bearing fruit. Head of the Tourism Linkages Hub, Carolyn MacDonald Riley, says the program is having the desired impact of connecting farmers with personnel in the food and beverage departments of hotels and restaurants. The initiative is a joint project by the Agriculture and Tourism Ministries. The next farmers market will be held at the Catherine Hall Sports Complex in Montego Bay this Wednesday. The next stop after that should be Ocho Rios. Nearly 2,000 residents of the Canterbury Land Settlement in Montego Bay, St. James, could soon receive certificates of title for properties they currently occupy. 
Minister with Responsibility for Housing, Dr. Morris Guy, made the disclosure during an interview with JIS News following a tour of this and other areas in the parish recently. He said the ministry was examining a proposal to purchase the land through the process of compulsory acquisition and then facilitate ownership by the current informal settlers. It is one area that we would be looking at to see whether the state will have a role to play in this, this settlement. The minister also gave an undertaking to work with the representatives of Canterbury to explore the possibilities for improved housing and other developments in the community. And finally, government's premier environmental management entity and the local university are teaming up to address matters of spatial planning and natural resource management. The National Environment and the Planning Agency Nepal and the University of Technology signed a memorandum of understanding recently to cement the partnership. We want to engage academia. We want to make use of the best, um, the best research, the best evidence um, um, research in the country to help us to make better and better decisions. We have expertise and we want to partner and we're happy that you have come to us. And that's it for GIS News Today. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Thank you for watching. Your silence worth the life of a child? Report child abuse. Call the Office of the Children's Registry at 1-888-PROTECT. Be the change. Speak out. Protect our children. We now catch up on some of the engagements that occupied Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller and her team of ministers at Jamaica House this past week. Prime Minister calls for teamwork to promote nation building. PM meets with EU Ambassador and Queen's Council Velma Hilton steps down from Commission of Inquiry. You're watching Jamaica House Weekly. I'm Samantha Allen. Prime Minister Portia Simpson-Miller is again urging Jamaicans to work together so that the country can grow and develop. She was speaking last Thursday at the Kiwanis Club of North St. Andrew 40th anniversary meeting. Our ability to survive and succeed depends on the extent to which we function well as a team. With a shared vision, and a commitment to work towards common goals for the good of all. Our destinies are inextricably bound together. She added that through hard work and determination by a number of individuals in different sectors of society, Jamaica had made progress in a number of areas. These include education, infrastructure development, culture and access to important amenities like water, electricity and telephone. We are extraordinarily bright, beautiful, gifted, talented and innovative. We are reflective of the past positive about the present, and optimistic about the future. We have to be conscious of our challenges and work relentlessly to mitigate their impact, but we cannot dwell on the negatives. We have to build on the positives and keep hope alive. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister commended the Kiwanis Club of North St. Andrew for its 40 years of service to the people of Jamaica. You have not only talked about service, you have demonstrated service by contributing to the lives of our people and our communities. 
She also pointed to specific projects of the Kiwanis Club which promoted human capital development, a strategic priority of the government. The Rubella Unit on Mannings Hill Road, the Youth Counseling Resource and Development Center at MICA, which provides counseling, skills training, and personal development opportunities for at risk youth. The 40 bed isolation ward at the Bustamante Hospital for Children and the Child Care Center for Children and Staff. And to recognize her 40 years of service in the public sector, Mrs. Simpson Miller received a plaque from the Kiwanians to mark the occasion. The head of the European Union EU delegation to Jamaica, Ambassador Paolo Amadei, has commended the Prime Minister for consistently promoting children's rights as well as her leadership on projects to reduce the number of juveniles in state care. The commendation came during a courtesy call on the Prime Minister at Jamaica House last Monday. Mrs. Simpson Miller thanked the EU and the United Nations Children's Fund for their technical and financial support to the Reducing Juvenile Population in State Supported Institutions project. The office of the Prime Minister announced last week that Queen's Counsel Velma Hilton was stepping down from the Commission of Inquiry into the 2010 West Kingston operation. Ms. Hilton was one of three jurists appointed by the Governor-General on the advice of Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller in late February to inquire into the 2010 operation to capture the fugitive Christopher Dudaskoke. Since the announcement, there have been calls for her removal in light of comments she reportedly made during another Commission of Inquiry in 2001. In her letter to the Governor-General, the Queen's Council said the proposed the Commission of Inquiry was very important to Jamaica and should not be hampered by politics and petty distractions. And that's it for this week's edition of Jamaica House Weekly. Join us next week for the latest developments out of the office of the Prime Minister. Welcome to the FSC Minute. I am Nadine Newsom. Today we explore anti-money laundering and its implications for the FSC regulated sectors. And joining me is Laurice Edwards-Brown, Director of Investigations and Enforcement at the FSC. Welcome to the FSC Minute, Laurice. Thank you, Nadine. What is money laundering? The goal of most criminal activity is to generate a profit. So in order to enjoy these ill-gotten gains, criminals often seek to disguise the source of these funds. So the process by which the criminals seek to put these ill-gotten gains into legitimate source of business or into investments is what is called money laundering. And what role does the FSC play as it relates to anti-money laundering laws? The FSC is mandated by Section 62F of the Financial Services Commission Act to put into place measures to reduce the possibility of its regulated sectors, that is the pension sector, the insurance industry, or the securities industry from being involved in any activity or in any offense relating to money laundering. The FSC seeks to implement such measures to reduce or to mitigate the risk concerning money laundering or financing of terrorism. And when these risks are identified, these measures will seek to alleviate the risks. Does the FSC provide specific instructions to institutions regarding the procedures to put in place for anti-money laundering compliance? No, the FSC does not. The FSC is a gatekeeper for the industry. And what we seek to do is to get the industry to work to find out what is it that they need to do to implement measures that can safeguard their own entities from being used into using schemes for money laundering activities. Thank you, Loris. My guest today was Loris Edwards-Brown, Director of Investigations and Enforcement at the FSC. For the FSC Minute, I am Nadine Newsom. Nutritious food, succulent dishes, superior workmanship, and excellent service. 
Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaica means building Jamaica. Jamaica's economic reform program is improving just about every sector of society, whether directly or indirectly. Starting today and every other Monday, Wednesday and Friday, we will explain key elements of that program and examine if and how government is achieving its targets. Let's begin with an overview of the government's economic reform program. <music> Government's economic reform program has four main goals, sustained economic growth, job creation, poverty reduction, and improving the living standards of Jamaicans. For the economy to expand, government is embarking on a process called fiscal consolidation, a policy to reduce debt. We cannot spend more than we take in. And to support that thrust, the majority of public sector groups are foregoing a salary increase until 2015. That and other debt reduction measures are reaping results. By the end of this fiscal year, our debt to GDP ratio will be about 7 or 8 percent lower than it was at the start of last year. That means what we owe versus what we produce would come down from 147 to 139 percent. In simple terms, for every dollar of goods we produce, we used to owe a dollar and 47 cents, and now it's a dollar 39. Government is also moving to increase the primary surplus. That's money it has left after paying its debt from 6.3 to 7.5% of GDP by fiscal year 2016-2017. If there's a primary surplus, government will have more money to carry out its core functions, like fixing roads, improving hospitals, developing the education system, and providing other amenities needed for social upliftment. Tax reform will support the move, streamlining the process and increasing the flow of money to government's accounts. Four laws, commonly called the Omnibus Legislation, have been passed by Parliament, levelling the playing field while ensuring that a tax break is given to sectors that can boost the economy. By committing to lower rates across the board and incentivizing production, whether the firms were large firms or small firms or medium-sized firms. But it's not only about tax incentives. Loopholes in the revenue collection system are being plugged and the tax evaders are being targeted. The fiscal reform is the critical element in a program of economic growth. And it alone has the potential to move us towards a trajectory of economic growth. And there are positive signs. The Jamaican economy recorded almost 1% growth in the July to September quarter and 1.4% in the October to December period. We expect that momentum to continue through the March quarter and we expect to end the fiscal year with growth somewhere between 0.7 and 1% of GDP. Since job creation is also a major part of the government's economic reform program, the Development Bank of Jamaica, DBJ, has made more money available to macro, small and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs. The MSMEs have been creating and expanding businesses to create more jobs for Jamaicans. And what we want to do is to encourage businesses to get in the get into the investment and we're seeing good signs. From April 2013 to February of this year, the DBJ approved almost 7,400 loans valued at over $2 billion to the MSME sector. That's a 50% increase over the $1.38 billion disbursed in the 2012-2013 financial year. For 2014-2015, $1.5 billion will come from the National Insurance Fund to provide more money to MSMEs. Expansion in sectors like logistics, infrastructure development, information and communications technology, agriculture and energy, tourism and the creative industries are also expected to provide jobs. 
poverty reduction and improving the living standards of Jamaicans are equally important. Come April 2014, the budget of the Program for Advancement through Health and Education path will be increased to $5 billion. That's a significant jump from the $4.1 billion allocated in the 2013-2014 financial year. And through a land titling initiative, the Housing Ministry is making land titles available to beneficiaries. My administration continues to make investments in people and social development even as we pursue our necessary strategy of fiscal prudence and debt management. The government of Jamaica is on a mission. Through a number of measures, it is going for growth, staying the course and transforming the economy through its economic reform program. Join us this Wednesday, March 26, for the latest on the tax reform component of the Economic Reform Program. Each time you're not paying full attention to the road environment, the greater your chances of getting in a crash like that. Plan routes to avoid focusing on GPS systems, prevent children from roaming in motor vehicles, turn down the volume of car stereo systems, pull off the roadway if you have to use mobile devices, do not read, watch television or eat while driving, avoid multitasking and keep conversations with other passengers to a minimum. Whether you walk, ride or drive, avoid potentially fatal distractions. So today's show is about creating the Jamaican reality we desire. The ERP is one of the government's contributions to that process. Up next, something for all of us to get involved with. I'm talking about the care and protection of our children in the road environment. Life in any form is a gift too precious to measure. The birth of brand new possibilities and exciting potential for whatever. For those at the early stages of this journey, it is expected that the ones who are older, those in positions of guardianship, will take the steps necessary to ensure their safety in all areas, not least of all as they travel from one destination to another. I think every single adult who is a driver has a tremendous responsibility, um, not only for the safety of children, but the safety of other drivers, pedestrians. Um, driving comes with a tremendous responsibility, and it's up to you to remain alert, um, particularly when it comes to children. Um, we are their guardians. Children are among our most vulnerable road users. It's why the Ministry of Transport and Works, and particularly the Road Safety Unit, has spent time coming up with measures to ensure that the traffic environment for them is as safe as possible. The law comes down very heavily on the side of children uh, when we act irresponsibly, and as a result, they are injured. Laws like the Road Traffic Act, the Child Care and Protection Act, and the Protective Devices legislation speak to the issue in some way. I want drivers to stop and I am at the pedestrian crossing. Drivers who ignore the prompting of a traffic warden to stop before reaching the place where children are crossing or seeking to cross, or who put the vehicle in motion before the children have completely crossed the road, commit an offense under the Road Traffic Act. 
Did you know that the Road Traffic Act makes it an offense for you to transport a child in your vehicle without the proper restraints? Breaching this law could place you before a resident magistrate facing a fine upon conviction. A child should never be moving in a moving vehicle. Um, they should be completely still, they should be seated because the car can come to a sudden stop and they will get hurt. If the child is under five years of age, then they need to be in their car seat or a booster. If the child is a little um, bigger than a car seat, um, then there are boosters provided that the, the children should occupy. You should ensure that the um, car safe lock is on, that the windows are turned up, or at least even if the windows have to be down, that the children are not exposing their hands, their heads, um, any parts of their body um, outside of the, the car because that, that is extremely dangerous. Well, you have to be focused fully on the road, both eyes fully engaged ahead of you. There are times when you may feel sleepy because you're on a long journey, you have not rested well the previous night. Um, you, there are things that you can do. You make use of rest stops. You, if you start feeling a little drowsy, you get out of the car, stop the car, get out of the car, and get some fresh air that usually wakes you up. Drivers need to slow down in front of school. Legislation is being drafted to designate certain areas as school zones where motorists will be required to cut their speed during specified time frames. That's just one of several measures being tackled to ensure that children are protected as part of the Road Safety Unit's aggressive move to enforce the national road safety policy. The unit also plans to deliver the road safety message to at least 130 primary schools every year with intentions to roll out the initiative in secondary and tertiary institutions. And there are plans to ensure that road safety is entrenched in the curriculum of secondary schools. The Ministry of Transport and Works is also doing its part to ensure that pedestrian crossings are maintained, sidewalks are provided, and appropriate signs are installed including at designated school zones. Our program on this station has come to a close, but you can always keep in touch with the JIS. Visit our website, jis.gov.jm, for this and past programs. Have comments or questions? Email us, Jamaica Magazine at jis.gov.jm. We maintain a strong online presence on most social media platforms, including Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. On behalf of the entire production team here at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.